Hello, hi everybody. Welcome to the last Hello, um, afternoon. Afternoon. the last uh, panel session for today. Paul, thank you so much for that very interesting presentation on biometrics and live detection. So moving on, our next, uh, well, right now we'll be discussing how to build trust with risk solutions for the payments ecosystem. And this afternoon we have with us Ahmed Mansour. He's um, the CIO of FinTech and blockchain expert. Ahmed, say hi. <laughs> Can you just tell us a bit more about what you do? And then I'll move on to the other panelists. Um, my name is Ahmed Mansour. I'm a chief information officer in one of the Egyptian banks. And I'm uh, an expert in fintech and blockchain in Egypt. I have been working in 12 years for the Central Bank of Egypt for the digital uh, channel regulations. And uh, uh, this is a brief about what we are doing now. We are interested in the fintech uh, sector and segments for startups and uh, in invading the, the digital transformation in the Egyptian uh, financial sector. All right, thank you. And next, um, we have Abdul Karim Abdul Jabir. He's the senior channel manager uh, for Bahrain, Oman, and Yemen at Microsoft. Can you tell us more about um, what you do in your role? Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Abdul Karim Abu Jaber, senior, senior territory sales, sales and channel manager for Microsoft. I've been in the region with Microsoft since 2006 in different capacities. Um, currently, in my role, uh, we work very closely with our customers and partners in their uh, enablement towards their digital transformation journeys utilizing the best solutions, infrastructures, and services um, to ensure customers are uh, digitally informed, enabled um, across all different segments uh, of the market. Thank you. And uh, next we have Rami Khader. He's the uh, Director of Cyber and Intelligence Solutions Middle and Africa for MasterCard. Rami, can you tell us a bit more about what right. you guys are working on? Yeah. Yeah. I hope you can hear me clear now. Yes. Can you? Yes, I can. Okay, okay yeah. great. Uh, thanks. So my name is Rami Khidr. I'm Vice President for Middle East and Africa and the Cyber and Intelligence uh, World for MasterCard. Uh, we work actually in MIA region to provide the uh, cyber and security solution with all our partners, issuers, acquirers, and financial institutions. Okay, thank you. Um, right, and obviously, last but not least, we have Ho Chang. He's the uh, CEO of BioID, who gave us a very interesting presentation earlier on. Um, Ho, would you like to say what you do? But I think that's kind of covered in your presentation. <laughs> Unless you have sure, be, a little bit more. I'll be happy to English say a few words. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, please. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, my name is Ho Cheng. I'm the CEO of the company. And uh, we've been doing biometrics uh, for over 20 years now. And our focus at the moment are uh, mainly online uh, identity proving uh, with a line of detection. And we empower e-governments, uh, e-learning, uh, especially nowadays, uh, during the COVID situation, we have a lot of customers uh, using our technology for work from home and working home to ensure that the, the connection, the connectivity between the uh, employees to the company's resources are secure. And uh, yeah, may, mainly on the FinTech uh, industry uh, for KYC ML purposes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, Obviously, this panel discussion is, uh, we will be talking about uh, how to basically mitigate risk for the payments ecosystem, particularly in the region, and perhaps if there's anything, uh, other sort of solutions there are elsewhere in the world that would also be good to bring in. Um, so we'll start with um, how the pandemic has basically given rise to uh, a high volume of e-commerce transactions and this has obviously increased security risk 
So the question is, are there new safeguards which can be implemented? And what are the lessons that either of you have learned over the last uh, six months to ensure, you know, use of, use of, to balance usability and security for the uh, users? So that and question for anybody specific, OK. <laughs> yes. uh, Abdel Karim uh, raised his hand first. So. No, you can go ahead. Uh, thank you. No, no, Look, this is my very... guess, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Look, this is, this, is, this is a very interesting question. And uh, especially in the last uh, 10 months, let's put it this way, um, we found uh, ourselves, we found people in a work from home model um, during lockdowns, curfews, and many other rules that has been implemented um, to prevent this pandemic from spreading. Uh, due to that, we've seen a surge and an increase in e-commerce, I believe, and uh, this required companies to provide more um, up-to-date secured platform solutions, secured connections, um, secured payment gateways, preventing threats, and all of these things. So um, companies have done their own pivots uh, in order to keep up with customers, shifting the needs to see institutes and new and, and finding new ways of doing business. Um, we've seen that from um, where I come from, the business that I uh, come from. And um, this whole thing came, I believe, with a huge security risk that uh, required to be addressed in an immediate uh, manner and companies need to ensure that they succeed in that. So um, the providers uh, that were providing these type of e-commerce solutions and, and payments and so on had to rethink, I believe, uh, with regards to their strategies, offerings, in order to accommodate that increase in demand uh, that comes as, uh, as we see as well with new security landscapes. So, um, mm -hmm. um, what, what, what they must continue uh, uh, doing in order while monitoring the needs and adjusting the services that comes accordingly from the customers that are sitting at home, um, um, shopping online, you know, uh, a lot of uh, payments has done, has had to be done electronically. So in order to ensure all that is de being done, we definitely, and the companies and the solutions providers, as well as the e-commerce uh, platforms that were implemented, needs to have new tactics in order to safeguard uh, both organizations and, uh, and uh, individuals, which also I do believe that it uh, made companies perform ongoing activities, adjusting technology standards, offering new security awareness, uh, offering trainings as well with regards to security in order to help maintain a security baseline. Um, that will allow these companies to always re-evaluate and uh, complement uh, security capabilities as they permanently adjust the, their operating models uh, to accommodate the increase that we saw in, uh, in e-commerce. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Abdul Karim. That kind of gave uh, a background for... Um, okay, just a minute. <laughs> I yeah. gave a background for the whole sort of situation in the Middle East. Let me just uh, bring it to Rami. I mean, you are right in the middle of it, being in Mastercard. So, how did you? Correct. What What are the like risks or you know security risks that came out, and how, how did you the last six months? So I echo, of course, first uh, Abdul Karim. Uh, he have a very valid view and very accurate. And yes, there is a new risk that came on, and it's not because it didn't exist but the new increase of web presence from players that were not in the field before kind of created a new gap or kind of created uh, uh, security risk or vulnerabilities open here. And it's not because their uh, lack of uh, measurements, but no, these new players brings new gaps to the, to the scene. Uh, and also, let's not forget the shift of the consumer behavior. So if you look at your wallet, you usually have the card that you pick it up and try to tap or try to dip in the machine. Now they don't use it. They actually use a card number or certain information like your own personal information. That brought uh, a kind of like a consumer expressing a high level of concern 
and uh, low level of confidence in the security of how do I protect my personal data also. So I, am, I know my issuer is protecting my card, but who also protect my personal information? That's a new area to them. We don't blame them, but they are new to this. So the, what we think of is how do we not only secure a card number, but how do we secure the identity also of that consumer? Part of it, like what uh, Mr. Ho mentioned, is the biometric. So I authenticate people as a biometric, but then I move to information. How do I do that? And we will talk about solutions, of course, during the panel, like uh, uh, a solution MasterCard provide, uh, it's called ID theft protection, which provide kind of a, a, a monitoring to your personal identifiable information and a resolution to treat the identity theft threats. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, um, obviously Ho mentioned uh, about biometric. We have a question from the audience. Uh, since we're still on, you know, sort of the background uh, discussion, the question is: What are major? What are, what are the major developments that you've seen over the year, and what kind of role? does biometrics play, especially around foundational ID? So when we talk about um, ID theft protection and securing data and uh, consumer data, so Paul, perhaps you can address um, from your point of view as well as a uh, uh, question about foundational ID. Yeah. Uh, you know, biometric is probably the the only way to link uh, a person to his uh, identity, especially digital identity. And maybe just echo back to the previous two speakers' uh, comment uh, that the COVID situation, for example, has expedited or sped up the uh, digitalization for every company in the world. And for those people who are already there or halfway there or never was prepared to do so, but never have a chance to do so, but they have to do so because they are forced to do so. So the explosion of the uh, digitization is what caused a lot of uh, things to happen. And of course, we, we look at our technology, for example, our service explode 10 times or even more in the past uh, this year alone. So it says a lot of things about what people were concerned about. They thought they would come to it, but they need to do it now. This is the the, uh, the the way we look at it. So identity proving, of course, is the way that we see is the fundamental thing. For those people who are working from home now, they realize that because when you are in the office, you have the secure infrastructure that you, you are in. So they, they are, the, the security measures will be much more lesser. But when you are working from home, that's a completely different way. This is why a lot of companies right now uh, are using biometric to help them to ensure that the employees are the one who are, uh, you, you know, are the legitimate user to access the company resources, for example. And a lot of companies are already doing it a long time ago. For example, a lot of call centers are already allowing employees to work from home. They already have this kind of infrastructure. But again, for those employees who are who used to be working in the office, now they need to work from home, the infrastructure would, would have to be uh, somehow modify and adapt, but with, with uh, biometrics help, they can do it with existing infrastructure the way it is, using the the, uh, the, the resources they have on hand, for example, using just a standard camera and a PC, then they can work from home. So this is why we, we think uh, biometric can help to, in that aspect. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ho. I just want to bring this um, discussion to Ahmed. Uh, obviously, Egypt is a large market and has quite a big sort of fintech uh, and startup community. So how has, um, what are the major developments there in the last six months? Um, what have you seen and how have sort of businesses adapted to it? And what are the issues that have arose from it? Well, you could share it with us. Well, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, actually, uh, when we started, the, uh, or when the pandemic started in in March, and we start have the, the, the wave here in Egypt, uh, the central bank and the regulators started to uh, uh, prepare a lot of initiatives to face this by initiating and accelerating the uh, electronic payments and the 
the identity verifications to avail for the customers uh, the electronic ways to uh, start engaging with uh, all the financial services instead of have it in a physical and uh, going to branches and have the social distancing and the lockdown and things like this. So uh, there was a lot of initiatives at this time. We uh, uh, we had uh, uh, an initiative for the EKYC and the electronic verification for the customer uh, so that he can open his wallet and have them availing uh, uh, the wallets to be opened uh, remotely from uh, using the, the mobile phone or from home or in any kind of service. And so we had uh, uh, two other uh, initiatives. One of them was for uh, availing the QR code and increasing the point of sales in Egypt by 100,000 uh, point of sale uh, to the merchants of class B and class C in all over the country so that they can have a QR code and avail the use of uh, the, the, the wallets and the electronic payments. On the other hand, they also uh, had an initiative to increase the, the, the ATM machines all over the country and in the, uh, the uh, upper Egypt, especially for because this is an area that does not have a lot of ATM machines in it. So uh, we increased this by uh, 6,500 machines all over the, 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 the others, the, the uncovered areas in Egypt. And all this was for, uh, actually the main purpose was for, for the financial inclusion, of course, and for facing such pandemic in, in such short time. Uh, what I want to also mention that uh, what we have faced in the financial sector from the pandemic is what is that we actually uh, had to change and adapt with changing the infrastructure. And this is goes with what you, with my colleagues here were saying about increasing the security perspective and uh, availing more uh, security prevention so that we can uh, work out with what's uh, uh, happening all around us from electronic and digital transformation. So what I see in Egypt, now, yes, we have a very big potential market. We have 100 million Egyptian. We have almost like 50 million with smartphones and the other uh, 30 million with non-smartphones. So we have a very big potential market uh, to avail the financial services on the electronic uh, channels, specifically for the electronic payments. And uh, the pandemic have accelerated very, very much how we are uh, tackling this market especially that we have a lot of youth in the market that have a lot of uh, innovations and a lot of startups that can serve these demands and can help with this. Keeping in mind, of course, the security perspective, and that's why the central bank have uh, initiated uh, a fencer for the financial services and for the financial sector for covering up the security issues that might appear from this digital transformation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you talk about, I mean, you've mentioned obviously this has increased the need to um, strengthen uh, security features around payments and uh, data. But um, so, do you guys, do any of you think that um, advanced analytics can help uh, businesses or uh, institutions such as your own identify risks and react quickly? How do they help? Uh, how do advanced analytics help? help? Machine learning or AI? Yes, Rami. Yeah, I, I like this question. That's why I raised my hand quickly on that. <laughs> the uh, AI model is very important and, and currently embedded in most of our models and most of the technology that we use. For example, identifying risk is not about just putting a rule to decline a transaction. That's 15 years back. Now it's mm -hmm. something that you need to make a decision for every and each transaction. So for example, in MasterCard, we provide a decision intelligence, which is powered by an AI model from Priterian, a company that acquired by, uh, it's acquired by MasterCard. Priterian model enables the scoring in the real time for every and each transaction uh, and that empowers our issuers to make a very quick and precise and accurate decision. So the AI enables our, the issuers, for example, to make a smarter decision through a combination of a fraud detection as well as the transactions insight. And that transaction insight, uh, it's not one data. 
it's thousands of data it comes at all channel from all channels but it is, goes all in one score that enables for example issuers to make that decision in a real time so uh, delivering the single transaction decisioning score versus only fraud score makes uh, uh, the consumer experience much better and reduce false positives so false positives is a genuine decline genuine transaction that's been declined because i think or it could be a fraud i want to avoid this instead of uh, declining uh, five or six transaction out of 10 why don't i only decline the fraud transaction but i approve all genuine transaction that will build the trust mm -hmm. And will make the cards top of wallet, regardless if it's a face-to-face -face or if it's an e-commerce. Okay, um, let's throw the uh, question to the rest. Yes, Paul. We've got whole okay. and then just, we'll get to you. <laughs> okay, so, sure. just, just a, a quick comment on the on this topic. Uh, yes, of course, we see the same thing. I think uh, artificial intelligence uh, or deep learning is. Uh, what we see the uh, to boost the the, te the 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 technology so so much, and uh, for us uh, we we mainly see a lot of things on the EKYC, or do we need the transaction for user consent, especially liable detection. With the presentation I did just uh, about an half an hour ago, it was never meant to cope with such a situation, but it is actually needed. So we were ready when when this uh, kind of requirements actually come into the market. So. Uh, using this light detection to do a lot of things uh, to ensure the trust as well as security. And the other thing, of course, is the identity proving. Uh, for example, a lot of people now, all of a sudden, they say, well, I need to open an account. I need to do that and do that. But how do you uh, now, uh, without going to the face-to-face uh, -face, uh, interaction, opening an account, for example? That's why our technology is using the AI to make sure that even though you use a 20-year-old uh, ID document, that you can still be validated against you the way you look right now, that this is the same person, okay? So we establish this kind of level of assurance for the service provider to ensure that whoever needs to hold an account because now they need to file their income tax uh, through or access the e-government portal or use it to do banking or something like that. Now they are using the technology that we, uh, we have developed. So AI is by far the best uh, uh, advancement that we have seen so far. Okay, um, just one more thing. On that note, Ho, I have a question yep. from the uh, audience. What uh, what will be the latest measure to protect privacy around the use of facial recognition? Okay, well, facial recognition is, has been around for many, many years. Of course, uh, first of all, uh, we have uh, guidelines. For example, in Europe, in, in EU, we have a GDPR. So the fundamental thing that biometrics uh, provider must do is to ensure that uh, uh, you do not keep more than the data uh, than necessary, okay? So uh, the biometrics vendors like, like us, so we only keep, uh, there are two aspects. One, if this is uh, performing a one-off uh, life detection, there will be no uh, trans uh, uh, data kept at our end, for example so that there's no trace, uh, it's a zero footprint transaction. If this mm -hmm. is one time per identity proving, the same thing. But if they are using biometrics for verification or validation later on, they enroll with the technology, we only keep the biometric templates. And the biometric templates, of course, is stored at a secure server like uh, the bank server or wherever. So they are located in a very well uh, secure environment that uh, the templates uh, is just mathematical representation of the, the, the face. So in terms of uh, privacy, this would, will not be an issue. It will be anonymous, even though the, the, the template will be uh, uh, compromised. There's no risk that can link back to the user uh, data. Okay. Um, Abdul Karim, would you like to give us your two cents? Yes, it's, uh, it's very interesting to hear from both Ahmed and Ho on uh, the usability of AI and how are they embedding it in their uh, services and solutions uh, to customers uh, across. 
Um, what I'd like to mention here is that businesses in general, um, um, what we've seen throughout uh, the engagements that we've had in the, in the market, they struggle to uh, tap on highly useful insights, you know. And this is due that there is an increase in volume, velocity, and variety of data that is available for them. But with the new technologies of uh, AI, machine learning platforms, big data, as well as advanced analytics platforms, now entities can gain critical insights and info that is easy for them to gather, to analyze, as well as uh, help them solve, solve their businesses' problems, improve their efficiency, and as we identify risks early to be able to react quickly and take quick decisions. So we've seen machine learning as well, cognitive services and AI helping customers to bring automation and digital experience into the users across their organizations. So they can enable both organizations and individuals to use predictive analysis, solutions that provide uh, much clear business insights allowing um, allowing organizations to identify as i mentioned risks early take quick decisions and ensure services are up and running um, the way we're looking at it from uh, our perspective or where i come from is that advanced analytics um, having the right advanced analytic, uh, analytics tools that is clearly visualized can turn more complex uh, findings into simple snapshots um, allowing uh, decisions faster, allowing actions to be taken faster, which, uh, which will lower down the risks and uh, identify risk early and lower down the risk uh, options that uh, might occur. Okay. Um, okay. Um, well, that kind of helped uh, address the advanced analytics topic that I was trying to get on. So just moving slightly away from that, apart from AI, uh, we have about we have about 10 minutes on the clock. So apart from AI, what are the new um, other technologies or developments that uh, you guys are paying attention to, which you believe can help with uh, cybersecurity risk and, and yeah, help your consumers and clients at the same time? Rami, <laughs> I, I I would give I would give Ahmed uh, also the chance. I know he he wanted to raise his hand. No 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 problem. Go ahead, Rami. Okay, so uh, uh, it's a good point, uh, uh, and uh, there is so many uh, new technology that comes now every second. It's not even every minute, and we try to cope with this dynamics, and we try to cope with all the new behavior of consumer. So whatever comes, uh, it's not only in, uh, as an AI, we try to add the AI to all of these models, but one is the cybersecurity. Uh, how do we enable the small and medium enterprises or the small businesses to create more business or to come with confidence into the e-commerce world? We have to give them the tools that can assess the cyber risk and assess their cyber security without putting a huge investment. So if I'm a small business, I won't be able to put a million dollar and just making just to make sure that my uh, new cyber world or new web present is secure. So I need to put the tools in their hands to make sure at least the basics are there and they can conduct the business with confidence, which will reflect eventually into the consumers. So the consumers will feel more secure if I am dealing with a business that at least have the minimum security measures. For example, and quickly on this, before COVID, I would never uh, go online to order my grocery. Now the grocery shop is literally under, down, downstairs, it's in the building but I also order online. It's not because I'm lazy, it's just because it's the, it's the norm now. But how do I make sure that when I put my details in that shop online, it's gonna be secure? So quickly on this one is, for example, in MasterCard, we provide uh, the cyber secure or the uh, a new acquisition, which is Risk Recon, provide an assessment on your cyber space or web present 
to make sure you at least have the minimum security or we identify what are the vulnerability that you need to address immediately. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ahmed, you had um, the second hand raised. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I'm not going to go far from what Rami was saying, and I am going to just add from the trends that we can see that uh, it's also running up right now is the, one of them is the blockchain, the mobile payment solution. And we have seen a lot of trends also that's raising now in Egypt, like the crowdfunding and, and the digital lending technologies and, and uh, using this platform for availing uh, services for the financial inclusion service. So what I also recommend is what Srami was saying is that we need the collaborations actually between the big uh, institutions like uh, MasterCard, like Visa, like things like this, or companies like this, and Microsoft, of course, to support the startups and support the new innovators in the market because it serves the same target after all, and they can gain from this collaboration on multiple uh, perspectives. But uh, yes, we have seen a lot of innovations, and we are currently have the sandbox in Egypt, and it's uh, the first cohort was about the EKYC technology and using this. And we have seen a lot of startups that's uh, penetrating the services, uh, although it have and it requests a lot of security uh, measurements in, in identifying the personalities and, and uh, the facial recognitions and biometrics and things that who have mentioned in a lot of details, of course, than me. But what I need to confirm is that, yes, we need a collaboration between all the pillars from MNOs, from the fintech regulators, from the entrepreneurs, from the uh, banking institutions and the big techs and the companies that's working in the financial services just to uh, to to build the base and an infrastructure base for this new normal that we are going to go into it all over together and we have to be all of, all on the same line from collaboration to face this because it's a new it's a new thing that we haven't seen before and it's a new trend and it's all digital, by the way, and, and, and the customer perspective is not going back. It's always going forward. So they are going to look forward for much, much better solutions in this sector. Mm -hmm. um, on that note, on how basically this trend of contactless payments will go on next year and forth. Um, well, yes, I was just about to ask your opinion on how uh, you think the trend will go on, how you'd like to uh, weigh in on that. I just Sure, I just want to make a, a small comment on this. Uh, the the looking looking forward uh, uh, after this COVID or uh, uh, since we are in the COVID situation, doesn't matter when the COVID is going to go away, and uh, the future will be completely different in in my in our opinion. Okay, and uh, looking at the ecosystem of the whole e-commerce or the payment systems. We think the EKYC as a service is going to be extended to other stakeholders. For example, logistics. Okay, we just mentioned that you know you now you 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 also buy a pizza or a grocery online. Okay, but uh, you know those kind of uh, EKYC responsibility is not just uh, the customer, the service provider who need to do so. Because now when you order something from Amazon, the delivery man or the post office or logistic DHL, they need to make the delivery to the recipient that they know they must be sure that this is the recipient that who is entitled to receive the goods. Okay. If this is grocery, maybe it's not that critical. If this is a prescription drug, for example, because you cannot go to the to the doctors to, for a prescription anymore, so you have to order online or you have to somehow be able to uh, let them uh, send it to you so logistics also will need to do so and same thing for the fintech companies if they need to send you a new car they have to be sure that uh, this is a recipient that we know for sure is the one that who is entitled to receive the the the, the goods okay so the logistics part is going to be something quite different uh, from now on because they need to tie into the ecosystem of the uh, uh, the, the whole e-commerce as well as the AKYC process that was originally meant for the service provider. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, uh, Abdul Karim, what are your thoughts on that? Yes, I was uh, bring the question. Yes, uh, I don't think, I don't think, I think the three gentlemen have covered it from all different perspectives. Um, and this comes, and the answer to this yes, question honestly comes from uh, who do you ask it for, right? So um, from, mm -hmm. from my perspective, 
we've seen that the payment segment and the e-commerce have evolved significantly due to the current situation in the past 10 months. And um, uh, both, both e-commerce and the payment industry is at a junction facing severe dynamics, innovations, and disruption in the traditional value chain of business and services. So uh, we've seen a huge increase in, in, volume, in volume of uh, non-cash payments, um, e-commerce, the rise in adoptions of uh, digital payment services and systems across all markets and segments, right? And uh, companies are now contributing to this growing trend in the process, making payments faster, simpler, and more secure. Uh, in that perspective, um, uh, the, the service providers now are assuming new roles, I do believe, and they are redefining the strategies within this new value chain we've talked about. And uh, technology companies uh, have a big role and a huge role to play in that, whether they are being a the secured component supplier or a secured platform provider, um, while exploring market opportunities that they can leverage their technological power and provide providing secure digital transformation solutions in the markets, creating new opportunities and new experiences for, uh, for customers. Um, in the same time, the technologies and the apps are creating challenges. Uh, and, I, and I'm sure um, the gentlemen and the audience are fully aware of this, while um, each of them is presenting a disruption opportunity. Um, having regulators in the region and in the countries remain focused on ensuring security, um, uh, for new technologies, solutions, the, the rise of a new entrant on multiple fronts from startups and innovators um, uh, in the markets, focusing and building, uh, developing as well, highly secured infrastructure solutions uh, remain the big focus for uh, those companies uh, in order to ensure anything new that can be provided uh, in terms of applications and technology in, uh, in the market. Thank you. Um, thank you. Well, um, we briefly well, have about five briefly briefly have minutes. About five. And I think it was a really good discussion. We began with the landscape and then went on to how the pandemic has accelerated digitization and cybersecurity risks in payment. And we've talked about solutions such as AI and biometrics and other advanced analytics uh, uh, solutions. So I just wanted to leave the audience with some food for thought. So I thought we could go around and I could ask if there was one thing that um, that, that, that you could mention, the one main thing that you think should be addressed imminently when it comes to payment, what is it? In your market or in your industry, yeah. Yes. Okay, Rami, and then Ho, okay. and then we'll go to Abdul Karim, and then Ahmed. Okay? Sure. So, uh, in, uh, in a few seconds, uh, the main thing that we should look for or look at is the consumer experience. If we put consumer experience in front of us, all the solution will be customized according to that. What what we what we've seen maybe previously is if you build the solution and start then selling that solution to the consumers you most likely will fail but if you have that consumer experience and the need for those consumers the solution will come to serve that need and help enhance that consumer experience which eventually will increase the business increase the adaptation increase the uh, the, the level of uh, satisfaction for both sides, not only for consumers, but also for the business as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ho, what are your thoughts on that? I just have two points to back here. Okay, you better know who's out there. That's number one, of course. And the second point is that uh, user experience. I think I need to echo uh, Rami's uh, comment as well. Now, so we're talking about uh, having a changing your behavior to adopt this online world. And uh, still you want to do a, a secure, uh, comfortable face-to-face -face transaction without having to show your face in a way. I mean, without having to see the other person. So this is uh, the way that we see it, is the user experience, uh, unsupervised uh, transaction or unsupervised uh, uh, services that uh, will be more and more online that uh, 
people can feel comfortable that they can do the thing that what they used to be or they are comfortable with or they are accustomed to do so in the past and they, they will be doing the same thing again but now with a different way of uh, user experience okay um Uncle Karim? Yes, sure. Um, echoing what both gentlemen said in terms of enhancing the user experience and from our perspective, make it simpler for both customers and users uh, utilizing and making the best use out of technology remains our main focus in terms of usability, in terms of deployment, in terms of availability. Um, for them. Uh, of course, all these should be uh, secured, um, governed, and within a compliance manner that helps protect both the organizations that we work with, as well as the end user um, that is uh, transacting or conducting business via the channels that we engage with, or the technologies that they are using uh, from um, a technology a cloud uh, provider. Okay, and Ahmed. Okay, uh, finally, I would, uh, I would look for this, this from another perspective as an electronic payment for the financial services that we offer in the financial sector. I think that uh, the main three pillars of this is the regulators, which have a lot of the challenges in the next year to accelerate the regulations that can support the electronic payments because electronic payments is a must. It's not uh, uh, an option anymore. Uh, second thing is that for the banks, they have to be ready. They have to be prepared for a change, a whole of a change in the legacy ecosystem and the legacy infrastructure that they have. And on the other side, the startups, uh, they have to be ready with new innovations to work in the market and be prepared with the solutions that can support the need and the customer uh, expectations and to meet with the propositions that they are waiting for. Uh, this is, I think, that should be prepared for the next year that we are going to face. Uh, we have, it, again, it's a must. We electronic payments and the electronic service is a must. It's not an option any longer. Okay, thank you for that, Ahmed. I think basically, largely, it just it revolves around user experience and anything and everything that comes with pushing that forward. Um, so that's all the time we have this afternoon. Thank you so much for your time, gentlemen. It was a pleasure having the discussion with you. It was a pleasure being thank here. You. With, uh, thank you, everyone. Gentlemen. Thank you very much. Yep. You too. All right, thank you. Thank you. Have a good day.